So give it a few seconds. There you go. Okay. Good evening. We're so glad that you've joined us tonight. Gallatin Valley Earth Day and the Valley of the Flowers Project are thrilled to present the story of plastic. Meet the director this evening. My name is Ann Reddy and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. I'm looking forward to hearing from our interesting and inspiring local sustainable heroes and of course, Dea Schlossberg in a few minutes. But before we hear from them, I'd like to remind you that you can still watch the film, The Story of Plastic, at your convenience anytime starting from now through Sunday, March 28th. And you can get the link on our website, which is www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org. These details are also provided in the handout that you can download and you can find it on the right top side of, or on the right side of your screen and Travis will give you some more instructions about that. So the film is free um, to watch thanks to the generous support from Hope Lutheran's Creation Care Team, Happy Trash Can, The Bozeman Farmer's Market, Treeline Coffee and Hebe's Grocery. While you're on the Gallatin Valley Earth Day website, check out our calendar of events, which lists numerous other Earth Day events in April, and also one next week, next Tuesday at 7 p.m. There's an event that you may not want to miss because it is called Local Recycling. Where does your plastic or where does my plastic go? with Alex Alloway of Republic Recycling. You can find out how to register for this event by downloading the handout, which Travis will tell you how to do. We'll also provide information in a follow-up email. Lastly, I wanted to thank Lot G Cafe for underwriting tonight's event. Also, a big thanks goes out to our major sponsors of Earth Day, who are supporting at least 30 free events online and in person this year. Our sponsors include Obos Footwear, Wrestler Motors, Greater Gallatin United Way, and of course, Sacagawea Audubon Society. A special thanks goes out to Sacagawea Audubon Society for providing our webinar platform for this evening's event and providing our great tech support tonight and our wonderful MC tonight, Travis Kidd. Travis uses his charms as the MC and MC for Sacagawea Autumn and Society's monthly virtual meetings. And in addition to being a Sacagawea board member and the education chair. Interestingly, Travis already knows Dea from their time at Montana State in the film school. So now, Without further ado, Travis, take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so quickly, I would like to familiarize you all with the controls for the GoToWebinar platform. So you should have a small window with a bunch of drop-down arrows off to the side. You can click those arrows to expand those side windows. Uh, you can open up the questions tab. Uh, that uh, is where you can write any question you might have for uh, for Dea uh, for the question and answer period if you would like me to field that question for you. Uh, you can also uh, use, if you click in the attendees tab and find your name, you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I can see that hand raised and call on you to ask that question yourself. I will ask you to unmute your microphone and uh, you can ask that question to Dea yourself. Uh, so a couple of uh, ways to go about asking questions. Also, if you look down, there's towards the bottom is a handouts list. There are five different handouts. These are all PDFs that you can download. Uh, with information about 
uh, Lot G and their sustainability and uh, efforts about uh, Gallatin Valley Earth Day, break free from plastic pollution, local recycling efforts, all sorts of different stuff. So uh, be sure to download those handouts. They should also be available in the um, in the email that we send you after this session. Now, let's see here. First, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Ren Killian. She is a mother, grandmother, nature lover, and photographer. Ren became an activist many years ago because of her deep concern for the legacy we are leaving our future generations. In 2014, Ren founded the Valley of the Flowers Project, a Montana-based organization whose motto is building community through sustainability. Ren founded the Bring Your Own Bag for Change program as a new, pro new approach to the critical challenge of reducing waste and improving sustainability. Uh, so Ren, let's get you on screen here. Excellent, welcome Ren. Hello. Now, uh, Ren, could you tell us more about the uh, the project for Bring Your Own Bag for Change and how that came about? Well, actually, BYO Bag for Change was one of the very first programs of Valley of the Flowers Project, and it's now in its sixth year. And in its first five years, BYO Bag for Change has worked to reduce single-use bag use at Heaves and a few other small stores, plus rose hours for a shorter period. It also raised about $5,000 in five-cent reusable bag refunds and bag sell proceeds to benefit many local groups, bringing uh, community gardens, recycling and compost programs, uh, bins and uh, youth nature programs, solar panels, trails, and more. And now that T Town & Country Foods has joined BYO Bag for Change Boomerang Bags community, the programs have reduced bag use by tens of thousands and have raised $5,000 in just a couple months. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about uh, Boomerang Bags and how that works? Well, Boomerang Bags is an international movement which began in Australia to improve stewardship of the earth through promoting reusable bag use, with many volunteers holding sewing bees to supply bags to borrow and return. There's a Boomerang Bag Group in Park County, which we hope to par partner with when uh, Bring Your Own Bag for Change move. Uh, starts up in the TNC over in Livingston soon. And Boomerang Bags Bozeman was started a couple years ago, and now many volunteers are sewing hundreds of bags. MSU students are making newspaper bags and t-shirt bags to keep uh, free bags available for forgetful shoppers, while, while sales of handmade bags are helping raise, uh, do fundraising for bike path from Bozeman to Belgrade and solar panels for our high schools. That's pretty cool. Um, how can people help out with this effort and keep it growing? Well, if folks would just ask Montana-based stores, even hardware stores, gas stations, restaurants, sporting goods stores to be the change and be part of the solution by joining the BYO Bag for Change Boomerang Bags movement, Montanans can show that we can take action cooperatively and voluntarily to change an unsustainable habit that's endangering the health and, health and beauty of our last best place. The customer's always right, so stores will join if people take the time to ask. And when I saw how politics and lobbying affected the results of bag bans, the skyrocketing paper bag use, thicker plastic bags, and the fees going to corporations, I realized that this program might be a better approach because it uses education and positive reinforcement and keeps the funds raised within the community. But bags are just the tip of the iceberg. So the Zero Waste Co Bozeman Coalition, Bo Zero, is the next step in helping educate and change habits to build a more sustainable community. And we are currently gathering supporters and stakeholders and we'll hold our first meeting this summer. Okay. 
uh, let's see. So what else can people get in, do to get involved? Well, first and foremost, Valley of the Flowers Project needs volunteers. So please lend your time and talents to the small grassroots effort and go to valleyoftheflowersproject.org to get involved. Second, the power of many voices will not only work talking to store managers to join BYO Bag for Change Boomerang Bags, but also with our state legislators and congressional delegation. They need to hear from you right now about two very important bills. You can go to meic.org and use the Montana Environmental Information Council's bill tracker to speak out against HB 407, which if that bill is passed, it will prohibit local bans on any food containers or utensils, and the final vote occurs in early April. And finally, today in the U.S. Congress, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2021 is being introduced. This is what I had 10,000 signatures for on a petition for and rode my bicycle from Montana to Washington, D.C. In, in April 2013 for. It will create extended producer responsibility with upcycling and closed loop systems and a national container uh, deposit and single use bag law, which will create many green jobs. Plus, this law will pause plastic industry expansion. Please go to breakfreefromplastic.org to ask our senators, Tester, Danes, and Rosenthal, Rosendale, to support this and co sponsor this bill. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Ren. I appreciate what you're doing to tackle this issue. I know there's a lot of energy that goes into it. And uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the helm of that. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, we have Serena Rundberg. Uh, Serena, uh, let's see here. Serena Rundberg of Lot G Cafe. She has underwritten this event. Uh, She's the founder and principal owner of Inspired Madness Incorporated, a thriving food and beverage group consisting of four unique establishments in Bozeman, Feed Cafe, Lot G Cafe, Daily Coffee and Eatery, and Steep Mountain Tea House, uh, which uh, used to be Townsend's. Uh, Inspired Madness has been working towards environmental sustainability for over 12 years. Inspired Madness is known for its commitment to creating and nurturing community. Serena, I know that maintaining both environmental and sustainable business practices is, is important to you. So can you share with us some of the measures that you have taken in your business to become more sustainable? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Travis. Um, well, as long as I can remember, I've had a deep love for food and eating out and the amazing and beautiful communities that I've lived in. Um, in the early days, um, around 2007 or 2009, excuse me, um, we we partnered with Western Sustainability Exchange for their sustainability certification. Back then, it looked a lot like um, fluorescent light bulbs and um, changing the way we recycled and um, using a lot of local foods and you know having a sustainable business practice that worked. Um, we also partnered with Bozeman Bike Kitchen in the city of Bozeman um, many, many years ago for a composting program that we jointly did. It was a lot of a, there's a lot of coffee grounds and a lot of a grapefruit peels back in those days. Uh, it was really fun to do that on bicycles in the wintertime with all of that stuff on top <laughs> of it too. Um, but really, you know, with restaurants, it's nearly impossible to have zero waste. And what we're working towards is near zero waste in restaurants. Um, we do this a lot of different ways. Most of the categories we focus on are waste reduction and recycling, um, sustainable food through local and regional suppliers, um, reusable and environmentally preferred disposables that are 100% compostable, food waste and post-consumer post based um, composting, which is something we've just really started kicking off a lot lately, chemical and pollution reduction, and transparency and education to others about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Awesome. 
you may wonder what that looks like. Yeah, exactly yeah. What we're doing. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned, we have gone to back in 2013, we were one of um, Heidi's first customers at Eco Montana using a fully compostable to go wares, utilizing that uh, many years ago, which has become just more and more important as the pandemic has, you know, the last year, so many places are doing so much more to go wear. Um, it's really nice that we're already in there and doing that. Um, and then we also have partnered with Happy Trash Can, and they're doing a lot of our post-consumer based composting for us as well. So for example, at Lot G, we have an actual bin where you can you know, come to us, have your beautiful meal to go in a compostable container, take it back to us for your next meal to go, drop it off in our trash, and Happy Trash Can will then compost that at their facility. Hmm. So that's a new new thing that we're we've partnered on. Um, we, we do the typical recycling stuff, fryer oil included. Um, we have used sustainable foods in our restaurants and cafes for as long as I can remember, as soon as I could, as soon as I figured out how to do that. And um, like I said, we, we buy within a four, we try to buy within a 400 mile radius as, as much as possible, especially at Lot G. Um, about 22% of our entire menu at Lot G is vegan. So we also reduce our uh, consumerism that way. Um, we you know, do as many bulk condiments, paperless payroll recycling, um, pre and post consumer, consumer composting, like I mentioned, and then water. There's a lot of ways to reduce water in cafes as well. Um, you know, Having your customers ask for a glass of water instead of just automatically offering it. Um, using low flow faucet heads. There's some really simple things that can be done to really reduce water waste as well. Hmm. I'd imagine a lot of uh, energy saved by not producing as much ice as well. Uh, <laughs> yes. Excellent. So um, clearly this is something you're passionate about and that you have sought out and taken the time to invest in personally. How do we as consumers like tell businesses that this is something that's important to us rather than exclusively eating at your restaurants how do we get the entire business community to buy in no definitely and that's you know that's going to take a lot of and more education which is also transparency and education is something that we're dedicated to so when we can get out there and tell people you know we try to promote it as much as we can through our social you know networks and all of that stuff but a lot of what um, we're doing is teaching our employees, you know, and th that's kind of the foundation. They're one of the most important people in our company as our employees yeah. and um, and our customers and our owner, you know, the whole the whole systematic thing. But when we can educate our employees, these younger people, these young generations coming into the, the food industry about how to do it more smartly, <laughs> um, it, it's just a great way to get people on board. Yeah. Hopefully they they carry that with them in all their career endeavors in the future. So, yes. uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the efforts that you go through and for being an example to the business community here in Bozeman. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for, and thank you for uh, helping with the event. Uh, up next, we have Dea. Dea Schlossberg. Uh, we are thrilled to have Dea with us tonight. Dea earned an MFA in science and natural history filmmaking at Montana State University right here in Bozeman, where she directed and produced the film Backyard, which looks at the human cost of fracking. The film won two student Emmys and picked up awards at film festivals around the world. Dea made national news in October 2016 when she was arrested and charged with 45 years worth of felonies for filming the Shut It Down pipeline protest in North Dakota. Dea is uh, clearly not currently in prison, so that must have worked out pretty well. Uh, Dea is currently directing the docuseries Bootstraps, which follows 11 households for two and a half years while each individual receives a basic income as part, as part of a groundbreaking UBI experiment, universal basic income. Uh, she was more recently named one of Doc NYC's 40 Under 40 in 2019. That must be uh, 
something nice. That's awesome. Uh, Dea, you made your directorial debut on Earth Day 2020, your feature film directorial debut with The Story of Plastics, uh, which premiered on the Discovery Channel. Dea, you are a graduate of the film school here at Montana State. Can you share with us a bit of your journey from film student to directing this this huge documentary? Yeah, um, thanks for all that intro, Travis. Um, it's really cool to be back um, in front of a Bozeman audience, even though sadly I'm not there right now. Um, <clears throat> I left Bozeman in 2014. It's so cool to hear about all these awesome initiatives that have come about um, since I left. I mean, just, just yeah, in the last 15 minutes, I learned so much about um, all the great stuff that's that's going on there. Um, and it makes me miss Bozeman even more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went to the, the grad program on um, science and natural history filmmaking. And what is um, really funny that I only realized partway through making this film is I remembered that for my second year project, um, for Phil Savoy's class, my my class project was actually looking at what happened to the recycling in Bozeman and where does it go? And that's the first time some of these concepts, um, well, the first time I learned about a lot of these concepts, Yeah. Um, that, that recycling is not what we think it is. And, um, and asking people on the street, you know, what, what happens once you, after you put it in your bin, like, where does it go? What is, and just um, learning that so few, few people had any idea what happens and and I had no idea what happened at that point. Um, so, so this is, I mean, I've done a lot of other things between that in 2010 and, and, and this being released in 2020, um, but it totally feels full circle and that I, I'm now able to, um, explore similar topics, but just with uh, just on a, on a bigger scale and with more resources and um, some amazing connections that that I'll get into um, further on in our conversation, but that that really um, opened my eyes. And I think and, and I was um, really honored to be able to share what I learned with everybody who's had a chance to see it. Yeah. I, I was super impressed with the film. It truly was a global project. Um, what was it like trying to pull together all these different people and organizations that you featured in this film? How did you even begin to approach such a huge, monstrous topic? I know as like a filmmaker, the more you can narrow it down to something small and specific, the easier it is to digest. But this is huge. This is really big. Yeah, it was super overwhelming. Um, first of all, we this this movie wouldn't have been possible <clears throat> had it been made any sooner. Um, the mm. executive, one of the executive executive directors, Steve Wilson, and I had talked about this project years ago when I was still in Bozeman, um, and decided it wasn't the right time. And it's a good thing we did because so much happened in this world in the interim, um, mainly the development of this break free from plastic um, global movement. And that's, it's not, <clears throat> it's not as much an organization as, as an affiliation of a ton of organizations worldwide who um, started talking to each other and, and realizing that they were all pieces of the same puzzle. and that if they worked with each other, their work could could build on each other's, and um, and this whole this whole system could kind of be um, the whole system of plastic production and consumption and, and disposal could could be like attacked from from all fronts from like a more coordinated movement to change the system that. That, that we've come to view as normal, but is not, and is not okay. Um, so once we, um, once we started making it in earnest, um, that organization had already been formed. 
so we um, worked really closely with them and the the leadership from that movement, um, and they kind of knew knew who um, like where the best examples of certain certain stories were and who were the best spokespeople for different issues. Um, and it, I mean, they were an invaluable resource. I mean, doing this just as a film team, it would have, I mean, it would have taken 10 years, 20 years, um, but we had the expertise of people around the world um, that we could just plug into and, and who would tell us, go check this out, go check this out, go talk to this person. And over and over, those people were just incredible. Hmm. Uh, what are some of the important issues that you wish you could have featured in the film that just didn't make the cut? Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad that we had a, the time constraint of a feature film um, because there are already, we already crammed so many issues in the, in that 90 minutes. Um, what you didn't want to make a, a 10 part, uh, Netflix docu-series like, <laughs> yeah. well, so the, the funny thing is, um, it was the, the film, um, certain, certain parties were, um, wanted the film to be a bunch of shorts and mm -hmm. were worried about holding the attention span of people for that long um about something that complex and i pushed back really hard on that because i think the the thing about this film is it shows how everything is interconnected and if you yeah. split those things apart you lose all of that right um, and so that was the crux of this film was figuring out how to create a through line that that did connect all these seemingly disparate pieces um yeah the film of your question but <laughs> i thought the film did a really good job of focusing on sort of the way that the fossil fuel industry and the corporate structure of needing a backup plan when we eventually move away from fossil fuels they need a business model to stay relevant and to keep growing perpetually it's like this dragon that you've fed to a point that once it's big enough you can't stop feeding it or it's going to destroy us all and it's kind of terrifying it reminded me a lot of the uh the merchants of doubt how uh using something like oh it's not our fault it's just you smoke too much or you consumers aren't doing your part to get rid of the waste responsibly and pushing all the blame off onto the consumer and the little guy and the public rather than tackling it systemically and trying to find better, more responsible and more fleshed out ways of dealing with the problem from point source to point source. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I thought the film did a really amazing job explaining that and how it's all tied together and it's all sort of related to choices within the corporate industry and the corporate culture. Uh, yeah. And just to, to jump off that, I mean, you nailed it with Merchants of Doubt and not only was it the same exact playbook that, that was used in sewing those the the discovery that you that sowing doubt was so effective um but some of the same key players um wrote the playbook that wrote the playbook for for tobacco um came and wrote the playbook for climate change and mm -hmm. and the doubt about climate change which goes right into the fossil fuel industry and extraction and that is plastics so it's there's a direct line yeah. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have any questions for Dea yourselves, to please feel free to write them in the question tab off to 
you're right. Uh, you should have a way to do that. Um, it looks like uh, we have a few questions for Ren that we can loop back to uh, at the end. Uh, but that, Dea, um, well, I realize I never actually answered your your last question. I kind of went off. Um, but as far as what I do wish I could have included in the film mm. more um, were some of the stories and people that we filmed with and interviewed and, and who shared their stories with us that we just ran out of running time to include, but um, had wonderful, powerful stories and people doing amazing work um that we really wanted to highlight and lift up and that um i mean that's the i won't say regret because that's part of the part of filmmaking but um i i yeah i was really sad to not include some of those mm. some of those actions some of those a lot of it was was more um in the activist realm um, that didn't end up making it in because, um, be just because we had to really focus on the the nuts and bolts of the system and mm. and the um, how the narrative is controlled. Um, so I think that's yeah that's really important, and that kind of leads into my next question, which is. I think in the last 10 to 15 years, um, we've seen politics become more and more polarized, and especially around social and environmental issues, to the point where even wearing a mask during a pandemic is now a political statement. And it's there's virtue signaling on both sides with it, and it's whose team are you on? Are you mask or anti-mask? And this reminds me of people that I knew back in high school who would throw soda bottles out the window and say, it's for the economy. I'm creating jobs for someone to go pick up my litter, you know, like, which is just silly and absurd because it's only ever volunteers doing things like that, you know, and <laughs> So as a restaurant server myself, I encounter people asking for straws all the time. And of course I have some in my pocket to give. I don't put a straw with every glass automatically, but you'd be amazed how many people proudly chortle and say, hey, could you give me one of them turtle chokers? And it's like they're- Wow intentionally sort of anti-reduction of plastic or anti-environmentalist uh, type thing and they take pride in that and it's part of their identity and how do we break that cycle around something that's so fundamental and is going to affect all of us eventually uh, i mean that is that's <laughs> a question um i kind of I kind of go by the um, the rule of thumb that it's it's a lot easier and more fruitful to um, convince people who who already believe that um, that there's a problem um, and already share the same values to to be to get activated than it is to totally change somebody's um worldview the entire worldview exactly yeah um and and that like we we have there there are enough people that want to see this change that want to see all different changes in the world um and it's just a matter of of uh people plugging in and people knowing what to do um to get involved and um yeah, to, to, I, I think that that's a much easier hurdle to clear and I think much, much more effective. 
Mm. Um, something I noticed in the film was uh, there was a lot of mention on the corporate side uh, in clips that you had of people on uh, like um, CNBC or things like that talking about how the majority of all of this plastic in the ocean is coming from just five countries in Asia. Yeah. And it's like there was a disconnect and a breakdown there because a lot of that plastic is American plastic that's shipped to China, sorted or dumped in a shipping container that fell overboard or whatever. Mm -hmm and eventually makes it in the ocean and it's like is that being counted as asian pollution yes and so much of this loops back to blaming the other mm -hmm. and because you as an american sure you might see a few bags and trees and some bottles on the side of the road but you can't like take a rake in the river and just scoop and scoop and scoop pitchforks full of plastic out like yeah. we don't see that nearly to that extent and yet it is a global issue it's something we're all contributing to um how, how like how has it, i hate to be, bring racism into this but it really seems like they're using asia as the scapegoat and it's the other it's not it's not us uh responsible white people doing it in america you know yeah 100 percent um yeah there's kind of two things going on one is it, it is absolutely othering and um well the twisting of the narrative that that it is all waste from asia um I mean, so many people had no idea that our waste gets shipped overseas. Um, in 2018, when China banned import of, of scrap plastic, like that was, um, that's when a lot of the world woke up to to that fact and uh, realized that the reason they don't see waste all over, like they do in pictures of those far off lands, is because that is our waste that we're sending there and yeah. um, which is the other prong of that 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 because we don't see it because we send it away it we don't realize how big of an issue it it is um yeah so those two i think if if our backyards looked like the backyards of um the community in in east java that that we were filming in and flying the drone over. Um, I think people take it a lot more seriously. Mm. Um, let's see here. So uh, Robin Louster asks, uh, there were no plastic bans in Japan when I visited in 1963. Now they are trying to get back to using uh, furoshikis, I'm not sure what that is, to lessen use of plastic bags. Uh, it's definitely a Western influence to use plastic bags. And that's something the film hit on a lot was it's part of consumerism. And that is a sign of middle-class living that you're not eating a fruit that you picked this morning. There's, there's this classist structure that exists around like the virtue of using packaged western goods um what uh i guess i don't know what my question is here but like how do we influence that mentality and sort of circle that back to uh sort of connection to local produce and reduction of use of plastic pack packaging um yeah i mean that, that's all about controlling the narrative and it it's these companies that push this narrative on developing markets as they see them 
um, that, yeah, all those things are representative of progress and a higher quality of life. And when um, we know that that's not the truth. Um, the the other thing that's that's interesting um, is like for example we as soon as we got to India um, we started noticing that so, that a lot of the trash wasn't uh, or in 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 the certain area a lot of the trash on the ground was completely natural biodegradable so there were like little clay pot shards and uh, banana leaves and things that have been used for ages to safely, cleanly package food products. Um, and the and the, there's no need for a massive um, uh, infrastructure to, to process those things because you can put them on the ground. They're benign, they'll decompose, mm -hmm. there's no issue. Um, so not only are these companies going into these places and predatorily um, selling products that people aren't asking for, um, bringing in packaging that, um, well, yeah, bringing in the, the product that they're not asking for, but also bringing in packaging that there is no way to handle, there's no infrastructure to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Granted, there's no infrastructure ever to handle the kind of right. packaging we're usually talking about. It's just more obvious. Um, mm. There's no infrastructure to hide the the right. waste. Yeah, our infrastructure just makes it less visible and yeah. keeps it out of yeah. our view and keeps us feeling clean. Yeah, but that lets that lets the companies blame the the users of their products um, yeah. for not handling, not disposing the waste correctly mm -hmm. yeah. um i noticed one of the things that you hit on at the end of the film was local and statewide initiatives to encourage reuse of plastic and glass and aluminum uh beverage containers uh using bottle deposit systems and things like that i grew up in michigan where uh, my entire life there's been a 10 cent bottle deposit so you buy a 24 pack of coke you're paying an extra two dollars and 40 cents that you can get back every time you return a can to the machine in the front of every single grocery store and how how is it that that's not a national program how how has that not been adapted universally and one of the big flaws like even as a kid i noticed okay why why is it that i get credit for collecting beer cans or soda cans but not water bottles or gatorade bottles it's like if it's not carbonated they don't want it so it it's a curious system and i've always wondered like is that just more of the corporate uh, corporate machine pushing back against states trying to institute new systems. Um, you mean that the fact that there is a bottle, just a bot bottle deposit in the first place, or the types of? I can talk about both of those things. Yeah, I guess, um, and, and sort of like, how is it that there there aren't new states adopting bottle deposits? Like, I don't know that there's yeah. been any added since I was a kid. Like every package had okay vermont california pennsylvania michigan like these are uh -huh. the states that you can return for a nickel right and I, I haven't seen that list grow yeah yeah it's it's uh definitely lobbying and um i think they're and and i can't i mean we can go into campaign campaign finance reform um but when you look at the the numbers like I, i'm sure michigan's recycling rates at least for those products are you know proportionally that much higher um than other states that have the five cent refund and then the states that don't have a refund um i mean it's so simple and it it works 
the like mm -hmm. it's just such a direct like one to one correlation um yeah and it is it is legislation um but it's also i mean fortunately or unfortunately a big motivator for a lot of um a lot of politicians is the economic argument and i mean there there is a really strong economic economic argument for for recycling um glass metal and high value plastics mm -hmm. so it's it's really confusing why those things are not kind of universally um, not necessarily mandated but just put out there in a way that that nothing else makes sense that then but to recycle those mm -hmm. um, and I I'm kind of assuming that people have for the most part had a chance to watch the movie now but I'm aware that some of the attendees probably haven't seen in, seen the film yet since it's available until Sunday I believe mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to yeah j just to just to say really quick um that we spend a lot of time dispelling this the recycling myth and and most of that myth is around these lower value plastics mm -hmm. um, so i'm not when i when i you know kind of refer to recycling as being ineffective it's everything but the ones and twos um mm -hmm. the little recycling symbol um because they're low value resins they don't get recycled there's no market incentive for them to be recycled it's cheaper to make mm -hmm. virgin, virgin plastics mm -hmm. um so th in that way plastic recycling is largely a sham um right well i've always I've always wondered this in terms of even metals and glass recycling and everything else. And you mentioned it, it's cheaper to create virgin plastics from crude uh, or from raw petroleum product. Is that largely because there is so much sort of fossil fuel energy infrastructure in place that is able to siphon this as a byproduct and it's sort of subsidizing the cost of having that extractive process and it's like when 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 is that calculus going to shift and all of a sudden it's cheaper for a company to mine aluminum out of landfills than it is to dig up a mountainside yeah and that's what i've been thinking about lately uh -huh. Mm -hmm. is like how much of this goes back to governments subsidizing these oil companies to keep extracting and keep growing and keeping this perpetual growth model going like they were talking about oil companies in double digit growth numbers mm -hmm. every year still like to this day which is insane and a lot of that's opening new markets and being really aggressive but mm -hmm. um yeah like what can we do to try and get rid of those incentives and level that playing field with alternative packaging or alternative uh resource use you know yeah um well first of all i like to think that these last these most recent pushes to to build out all this infrastructure and to develop um natural gas um processing plants like it's it's all the final like death throes of this industry um i think they're kind of putting everything they have into this market as it is right now because they're so afraid of what it's going to do in the near future or the slightly longer term future um so so i'm that's my hope that i i'm hopeful that that it's gonna kind of that it's gonna tank um very soon um but what we can do is a kind of a, a combination of 
top-down initiatives and bottom-up initiatives. And um, I think it really takes both. Um, certainly, so I was excited to hear Ren mention uh, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that was introduced today in Congress. Um, that's really progressive. It looks at, I mean, as she mentioned, extended producer responsibility, making these companies pay for all of the externalities essentially that they're creating. Um, but it also it also tries to curtail the and any new uh, development, any new extraction. So until until now, at least in the US, most initiatives have focused on end of life and cleanup and alternatives to um, consumer goods. And this um, this act would like how I, I I usually say just stop the bleed, like um, prevent the extraction in the first place, because no amount of cleanup, no amount of different consumer decisions in and of itself is going to change this system. Um, those things are good, but we really need to stop the stuff being made in the first place. Um, I mean, the the animation in the film of cleaning up the, the water flooded all over the floor before you turn the tap off is really mm -hmm. like really spot on. Um, and and so if we have those those top down um, if we have the top down legislation as well as local ordinances. Um, setback rules and um, like changing point source emission rules and um, like those those all make the other downstream efforts that much more effective. Mm -hmm. um, so it really takes all 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 sides, all hands on deck and um, yeah. So um, it looks like uh, Julie Basteri has a question. She has her hand up. Um, let's get your mic on, Julie. You can unmute yourself. Oh, um, it's Julia, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, um, Julia. No worries. I was just wondering, like, why do companies continue to make the low value plastics, like the threes and the fours and the fives and the six and the sevens? Like, is it just cheaper that way? And is there, uh, is it viable, I guess, to put infrastructure in that would allow us to make those recyclable? Or do they just degrade so, like, perversely every time we try to recycle them that it's just not worth it anymore? Yep. Yep. You kind of answered both your questions. Um, it's definitely cheaper, um, and those are, are resins that can only be downcycled. Um, so yeah, they can only be remade into something once or twice before the, the material has no like structural integrity anymore. And, um, so a lot of those, a lot of those low value resins get made into the Trex material or benches or, um, or, or plastic bags. I mean, plastic bags are super, super low value and often like the end of the line for other plastics. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you kind of mm -hmm. nailed it. Can the ones and twos be recycled more than once or can they be like upcycled, I guess? Um, not upcycled, not but upcycled. Can be effectively recycled. Okay. And that's 2% of all the plastic that that exists, 2% can be and has been effectively recycled. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got, so kind of looping back a little bit to the uh, sort of top-down approach, uh, Kristen Walzer asked, or mm -hmm. said 10 oil companies met with Janet Yellen to show support for a carbon emissions fee 
this week. Your film made their statement seem like another sleight of hand. They don't want fossil fuels used for non-emission uh, uses taxed and are willing to sacrifice fossil fuel combustion to keep the plastics industry going. Do you know the money they get from plastics compared to fuels? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know those numbers. I know recently, I believe it was like 15 to 18% of their revenue came from plastics. I'm kind of, I'm hesitant to put those numbers out because I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but the trajectory was really steeply upward on, on the plastic side. So those, they saw those markets growing tremendously and whereas the other, the fuels markets were de decreasing. So they're, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely throwing everything they've got into the, the plastic side of things. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I should, I should look up that, those numbers. Uh, Laurel Eastman has her hand raised. Uh, Laurel, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you're available. Hello, thank you for taking my question. I loved the film. Um, I found it also very um, impactful emotionally. It was definitely hard to see some of the images of um, especially the waste being processed in um, some of the low-income countries. And I sort of walked away from it thinking, I really don't want to throw things in the recycle plastic in the recycling anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially if, you know, I spend a lot of time in middle income and low income countries myself, you know, and if we're trying to do recycling there, what did you, did you have a similar feeling or, or, or what, where do you stand? I mean, I'm really excited to hear what the person will say next week about where our recycling goes and probably here in the United States, maybe it's a little bit better, but I think about other places I go. What do you, what are your thoughts? Um, it really is a global market. So when you're seeing people in um, developing countries sorting low value plastics those are a lot of them are are our plastics um, um I lost the train of thought um sorry I guess the question is do you after making this film do you think that recycling plastic mm. is the right action right now I think Definitely ones and twos is is absolutely worth recycling. Um, I still recycle the lower value ones that I know are collected in my area. Um, I know the reality of that is they might sit around in bales until there is a market in another country that has decided to import scrap plastic um, or they might be thrown away at the material recovery facility because there is no market for those low value resins mm. um, but i do i do put them in the bin if they're collected because the alternative is directly to the dump um, which maybe is better because we will end up mining our landfills. Um, maybe we'll know how to better deal with our waste at that point. Um, and we're not burning fossil fuels to ship it to Indonesia. Right, and they're not just gonna get burned on the other side of the planet and um, mm. and hurt people's health there. The The solution is to avoid buying those kinds of of plastics and it's really hard it's really hard like um i mean I, yeah just the move toward zero waste in in so many communities and i'm super excited to hear about bo zero um is really exciting because that that's the answer like we just need to stop making those things um mm. so as much as possible just um like I, I always try to um, 
try to emphasize um, the fact that we uh, making our individual consumer decisions um, are not the problem or the answer. We can do, we can be mindful of all of our decisions. We can do the best we can um, within the system that exists, but the best thing we can do is try to change the system. So yeah. if you, like what the, what the companies want you to do is feel really guilty about your own decisions and fret about that rather right. than looking at how to change your options in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, because they don't care once you've purchased the product or once the store has purchased the cases of plastic bags, then what happens after that is no consequence to them. Mm -hmm. And right. they don't have to pay for it. Then that's extended producer responsibility. That's something that I've always been frustrated with with sort of consumer capitalism is that I really don't think boycotts really work in maybe this is just my own personal like feeling because unless you're incentivizing an alternative in a powerful way you're not pushing the needle in a significant way for the industry, right? Yeah, and like, I, I, didn't I don't think really think to... Dow Chemical cares that I like jump through hoops to live a year without touching plastic. Uh -huh. Like right. I could get hit by a bus. It's no different to Dow Chemical. You know right. what I mean? Dow doesn't and, care. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those actions are more about awareness and raising awareness in your community um and and getting involved and and those actions usually lead to um further action so i'm not i don't want to discredit or discount um those efforts but that's not where the effort should stop mm. that's a good um gateway so action. that kind of leads to and we've kind of been dancing around this like for me personally like I've always had a hard time with taking on too many causes and seeing the world on fire in so many different ways and not always feeling guilty for not having the personal energy to like fight all of those battles myself if there was just one or two small things that I could do as an individual to sort of lower my impact on this entire systemic problem, what would you encourage me to use my energy, for, put my energy towards? Um, I, I don't think there's, I don't think that's a one size fits all answer because I think everybody can be most effective in what, in, in, the best way they can plug in mm. um, for me it was using filmmaking which is what i chose as my career and what i love doing um but if i mean if there's a, a institution that you're a part of it can be working for change in that institution or if there's a mm. municipality you work with it can be working for change at that level um i would say what you can best do as an individual is get involved in something bigger get involved with um with some sort of community because there's no question that your efforts will be um amplified if you're working with other people hmm. cool well thank you um let's oh, see I just um, on that too, uh, one of the handouts, actually, it's not, I don't think it's one of the handouts, um, but it'll be going out in the, the follow-up email, is the link to um, the Break Free From Plastic movement, and it's breakfreefromplastic.org, um, but it, it lists like the 
15, 16, 1700 global organizations that um, you can contact and get in touch with and figure out, you know, which area speaks to you, which, which topic speaks to you, and there's a gajillion places to plug in. So that's how you can find your niche. Um, excellent. That's definitely an important resource. Uh, looks like Kathy Powell has a question. Kathy, you are free to unmute yourself. There yes, I, I was interested in the filmmaking process um, that you did. And did you travel to some of these global places to uh, film or did you do it more electronically or by phone or through other people in the area or both? Um, almost all of it was filmed by our little team of four. Um, we went all over the world in 2018, 2019. Um, yeah, it's, it's super bare, bare bones crew and um yeah like all of the all of the interviews all of the stories we went more deeper into that was just us filming um and then for there were a few like little pickup shoots that um we hired local crew to get after the fact or um worked with somebody in the movement to get footage that they had of a, of a specific location. Um, and then of course all the archival stuff that was just mining, mining different, different resources online for the most part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Robin Louster asks, would you support a national plastics czar to deal with all plastic problems? Uh, someone appointed by Biden, uh, is that something we should push for? Would that, do you feel like that might be effective? Um, I think it would only be effective if they worked super closely with, um, Deb Holland, um, with um, with energy sector leaders, um, I would worry that a plastic czar, if not totally connected with those other um, those other areas, would would tend to focus a lot more on the the waste side of things hmm. um i mean if they if they did it right and looked at it holistically then that'd be awesome um but yeah i'd kind of want to see it by title from the get-go combined um with with land use with energy with extraction to to tackle those as as one problem with climate so it should be it should it should be a part of that conversation right um let's see uh robin also had a question are you going to make a con a, a companion film or any short youtube films with the people that you had to leave out some of the activism stuff it sounds really worthwhile. Maybe present it to Bioneers, she oh, suggests. Yeah. Um, so two of the producers on the project, uh, Stib Wilson and Megan Ponder, formed a spin-off organization called um, Peak Plastic Fund, P Peak Plastic Foundation. And they're using um, a lot of the materials and um, still working with a lot of the same people that were in the film to keep keep making shorts, keep telling stories, um, and keep telling more relevant, timely stories, so, you know, as this as this whole issue keeps changing all the time. Um, so they're doing that work. Also, Story of Stuff as a presenting organization also has their their digital platform. They have a ton of followers on their social media and they have 
the ability to to create all different smaller pieces for online consumption. Um, and then we're all connected to Greenpeace as well, and they make a lot of great pieces. They have access to um, to that footage and those stories. So it's there's a lot of people still working with with that footage and those people. And um, yeah, there's it, it's not going to get um, lost in, in on a drive in a closet somewhere. <laughs> How many drives do you have in closets, Daya? <laughs> uh, a few. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a a never-ending stream of terabytes piling up in the closets of all filmmakers. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, um, what? if anyone else ha oh here was a question um we get so much fresh food from mexico how is mexico doing with recyclable or natural packaging uh, i don't know a whole lot about mexico's waste um systems I know that a lot of the statistics that we worked with in our research and in the film were North American mm -hmm. and the US and Canada were a larger, the US was the, by far the largest part of that North America um, stat, um, but, but of the three countries, Mexico had the, the smallest footprint i believe footprint in terms of plastic waste uh yeah. production yeah and export export right. plastic okay plastic and... well but and yeah. i think that that quite that this question might be sort of looping in how how the food that we buy in stores that is grown in mexico or grown in costa rica is shipped and packaged and processed and a lot of that is decisions being made by multinational food corporations like exactly. dole or tropicana yes. or whoever and exactly. plastic packaging is not made in mexico right yeah and those decisions aren't being made by a company in mexico that is decidedly selling straight to the united states it's truly a global Mm -hmm. sort of food industry in that aspect Absolutely. um i know as a former grocery store employee uh a lot of i worked in a produce department uh a lot of things like green beans that are sold loose on the shelf that you bag yourself um get shipped in hard-sided collapsible plastic crates that I believe a lot of those get returned and reused similar to milk crates yeah. and dairy companies. So uh, mm -hmm. the ones that aren't collapsible, I have, I still have some that I use as storage bins in fact, but uh, so there's some effort there, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Apples, it's, it's a toss up. Like, with some apple processing companies they'll be packed in 40 pound boxes in rows separated by either soft cardboard or styrofoam and it's kind of a toss-up which one you get so mm -hmm. and even the even the cardboard ones have a moisture wicking foam vapor barrier between yeah between those layers of cardboard so right. it's yeah i don't know it, it's a it's a huge huge system when you start talking about food and packaging and how it's how it's shipped uh because even the stuff that you think is unpackaged like could be being shipped in styrofoam or plastic or yeah. whatever else and some of that gets reused and some of it doesn't so uh one thing that I've noticed a big shift in, especially with microbreweries, is moving away from the cuttable plastic uh, six-pack rings yep. 
um, that we've all seen images of turtles turned into um, bumblebee shapes uh, by and shifting over to the hard plastic snap-on mm -hmm. style. What I haven't noticed is any concerted effort to where you can take those and drop them back off at a brewery. Right. Right. What sort of um, are there are there systems in place that you know of to sort of immediately reuse rather than have those get chopped into uh, chips, melted into extruding tubes, and then like not I so don't, much. There should be because those yeah. are hella durable, so it'd be and an easy immediately reusable. Yeah. Hmm. I've been slowly uh, saving mine up, hoping that one of the breweries might take them yeah. one of these times. I don't know. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Probably. I mean, we'll let see. us know if you. Uh, if you I'll, I will report back. <laughs> I'll cool. meet you all back here. All right, week. sounds good. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> let's see. Is does anyone else have any questions? I know we've kind of gone over our time. I don't. I don't believe in hard time limits on Q and A's. <laughs> Sorry, Dea. <laughs> you are at our mercy. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Dea, was there anything else you wanted to say? Any parting thoughts? Um, just encourage your representatives to support the Brick Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Um, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, for checking out the film. Um, yeah, it's going to take all of us. Awesome. Well, thank you for all your efforts in producing it. I would like to invite the entire audience to uh, unmute yourselves um, and give Dea a nice round of applause here. It might sound like an empty auditorium, Dea, but I know we have uh, quite a few att uh, attentive attendees, so thank you. Um, Anne, uh, welcome back, and I will hand things off to you for some parting comments, and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Travis. Uh, I just enjoyed that so much. So thank you so much. What a great conversation and so many great ideas shared. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and please look for our Earth Day passport, which once you collect enough stamps will enable you to put your name in for a drawing for a great prize. The passport will be available soon online at our website and at in-person Earth Day events in April, such as our Earth Day Festival at the Bozeman Library on April 17th as well as our other in-person events. Also be on the lookout for a follow-up email which will list upcoming events. And I just wanna thank thanks again to all of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day and the Valley of the Flowers project volunteers who helped make this evening a great success. And that includes Lorreen Reed, our great tech person tonight. Thanks so much also to our great MC, Travis Kidd, and of course, thank you to Ren Killian, Serena Runberg, and Dea Schlossberg for making this such a fantastic evening. Have a wonderful evening, and we hope that you can join us for another Gallatin Valley Earth Day event soon. Good night. Thanks, Anne. Night, everybody. Thank you.